Well, hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which brings together at the moment 84 national associations of Christian doctors and dentists around the world, uh, totaling some 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists. And I say at the moment because next week is our World Congress in Tanzania, in East Africa, and we are about to admit another 20 national movements into uh, ICMDA. So that will take us well over the, the 100 mark. Well, today uh, on ICMDA webinars, we've got Dr. Jay Smith back as, uh, on the, the third of his series of four on understanding Islam. And today we're going to look at the life and work of Muhammad. And I can promise you there's a lot of new material here that you will not have heard before. So uh, it's a great to have you back again, Jay. And uh, on this subject, Muslim tradition teaches that Muhammad was born in Mecca and then moved to Medina, both in Central Arabia, in 622 AD. Important date to remember, 622 AD. And that during this period, Muhammad received the Quran and became the paradigm. Uh, it became the paradigm for the Islamic religion practice today. But what do historical sources reveal? That's the question we're looking at. And this webinar is going to evaluate the historical record of Muhammad using evidence from the seventh century and before and comparing it with traditional teaching. Dr. J. Smith has worked with Muslims since 1983. He's got two master's degrees and completed his PhD in Islamics in the areas of apologetics and polemics in 2017. Jay is one of Christianity's principal public evangelists and debaters to the Muslim world, and he travels extensively teaching apologetics for those exploring ministry to Muslims and engages the movers and thinkers of Islam on a weekly basis. He's the founding member of the Hyde Park Christian Fellowship, a, week, a weekly evangelism ministry to Muslims in London's public squares, and as well as a co-founder for the Fanda Center for Apologetics. He is also the director of MAPI, M-A-P-I, which is a new master's in the apologetics and polemics of Islam. This uh, is coming out of Veritas University in California, and you can do it uh, online over two years, uh, Monday nights, and I can promise you that is a, a brilliant new program, and there'll be more information of that when we write to you after the webinar. But Jay, just a pleasure to have you back again today and we look forward to uh, more uh, enlightening stuff on the history of Islam. Thank you. Great, thanks Peter. Let's get right into the PowerPoint. And as you can see, we're going to be looking at the importance of early Islam historically. Uh, this uh, is another way of saying we're going to be looking at Muhammad. This is the newest research on the historical problems with the Islam's origins, which is an area very few people have looked at. And that's why for many of you, much of what I'm going to say uh, today is probably new. Three areas that we are investigating in this series of lectures. The first one we did earlier was looking at Mecca, a historical assessment of Mecca. Today, we're going to be looking at a historical assessment of sources and early Islam really looking at who is this Muhammad, where did he come from, and did he actually even exist, which is a huge question to ask. And then the next lecture will be on a historical assessment of the Quran itself. Now, that could be a, an entire series of lectures in and of itself. The Quran is such a big area, a big subject, but that will wait for later. Remember what we said <clears throat> earlier in the last lecture, Islam is completely dependent on three things, the book, the man, and the place, the book being the Quran, the man being Muhammad, and the place, Mecca itself. Those are the three things. You take away any one of those three and question them historically, and the other two come cascading down. Since these three areas are foundational to Islam, we should investigate them. But listen, I don't want to investigate them from the what the people in the 9th and 10th century uh, said. I want to go to the period 
where these three existed, the seventh century, in the place they existed, which means the central part of Arabia known as the Hejaz. So let's continue by looking at the problem of sources. This is why in some ways this should have been at the very beginning, but I wanna bring it in this lecture because that before we move on to Muhammad, we need to look at where all our material concerning him and early Islam, where it all originated from. All right, so let's begin with the problem of sources. Where did what, uh, what we know about Islam, about the book, the man in the place, where are, what are our sources? Here's the map uh, that shows you what we're looking at. When you look at the central part of, uh, of, well, the Middle East and North Africa, according to the Islamic traditions, according to standard Islamic narrative, Muhammad's empire in Cape, in, uh, in Cape, or encased that brown area that I'm pointing to right now. And that was the area, this is what Islam tells us. This is not what I'm saying. This is what Islam tells us. That area existed under Islamic control by the time he died in 632 AD. After he died, uh, you have Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, the four rightly guided caliphs, and it moved into this area, the orange area. And that was about, we know that is the Rashidun period, the golden age of Islam, as Muslims tell us. And that was roughly a 30-year period from 632 to 661, when Ali was then killed at the Battle of Sifin, and Mu'awiyah, the first caliph of the Umayyad caliphate, then took over and then expanded the borders during the Umayyad dynasty from his period, 661, up until 750, so roughly 90 years. It moved into what is the purple area. And that's what we're looking at. That's all I'm concerned with is what you're looking at the map now. Really, I'm not concerned with the purple area. That's too late. Uh, well, parts of the purple area, yes, but I'm more concerned with the brown and the orange area. That's where the story had took place. That's what uh, how Islam began in that area. So let's really zero in to that brown and the orange area. And let's look at a timeline because this is what Muslims tell me. This is the only story you ever heard. This is the narrative from the standard Islamic narrative uh, from the Islamic traditions concerning Islam's emergence. Islamic traditions tell us that Muhammad was born in 570 AD in Mecca, uh, that the Quran was revealed starting in 610 AD, and that in the 621 AD, in the middle of the night there in Mecca, Muhammad was woken up, told to get on the back of a winged horse by the angel Gabriel, and he flew up on this winged horse called the Burak up to Jerusalem, where he then ascended the seven heavens up to meet with Allah, and Allah told him to pray 50 times a day. He comes down to the fifth heaven. Moses is in the fifth heaven and uh, says, how many times did he ask you to pray? He said 50. So he says, no, go back and see if you can get it down. So he bounces back between the seventh and the fifth heaven and brings the prayers from 50 to 45 to 30 to 15, 10, down to five prayers. Once he gets it to five prayers, Moses says, okay, go back to earth. That's enough. That's why we have five prayers today. That happens in 621. In 622, the next year, he then leaves Mecca, moves up to Medina, which is just north of Mecca, up on the plateau. And there he then creates the Islamic Khilafah. The first Khilafah was then created under his authority in 622. In 630, he comes back and he conquers Mecca. So then he expands his borders, starts to move out and through that whole central part of Arabia. He then controls, takes under his control, and then he dies in 632. So that's Muhammad's life from 570 to 632. This is what every Muslim knows. This is what you know. This is the only narrative that we have been taught. When he dies, Abu Bakr takes over for two years. He dies peacefully in 634, expands the borders beyond that central part of Arabia up to the north and also to the west and the east. Umar then takes over after Abu Bakr dies and he does the greatest expansion. Uh, pushing the borders all the way out to Afghanistan in the east, 
to Turkey in the north and to Tripoli in the west. He is killed in 644. Ten years later, Uthman then takes over, and Uthman uh, is, part, is the one that's best known as the one who then compiled the Quran in its complete form. So the Quran we have in our hands today is uh, his, and of course that happened in 652. He is then killed in 656, and Ali, the adopted son of Muhammad, then takes over, and he only rules for five years. All of these four men are there in Medina. That's where the headquarters is. That's where they're ruling. And then he is killed at the Battle of Sifin in 661 by Mu'uwiya, who then creates the Umayyad dynasty. So that is the story of Islam. There you have it on a timeline, visual, so you can see it. That is their story, not my story. But of course, that's the only story you have. Now, Islam was therefore fully formed in the Hijaz by 661. Here's the question. How do we know all of the above? How do we know everything that we're looking at? How do we know any of those instances or any of those historical events? Where does the material come from that, that's, that talks about Muhammad's birth or the Quran being revealed or Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali? Where do we go to find out about all this material? You'd like to ask, right? Well, let's look. Let's put another timeline on and let's see what this timeline tells us. Now, according to what Islam tells us, this is their, again, this is still their material. I'm not making this up. Everything I'm going to be saying comes straight out of their traditions. That This is what the tra traditions tell us, that Muhammad dies again in 632. We know that. And how do we know it? Because of the biography of Muhammad, known as the Sira. And the Sira is false was first written by this guy here, Ibn Isak. Notice his date when he died? He dies in 765 AD. Ooh, hold on a minute. Muhammad dies in 632. This is 765. That's 130 years after Muhammad's death. We get the first biography of Muhammad written down. But hold on a minute. This book here that I have in my hand, I don't know if you can see it. This is his book. This is the biography of Muhammad. This is what we're told. All of us are told that this is the book that Ibn Isak wrote. In fact, it even says Ibn Isak. There it is on the cover. But this is not from Ibn Isak. None of it is from Ibn Isak. It all comes from this guy here, Ibn Isham. Look at his death date. He died in 833 AD. Ibn Hisham is the one that gives us the story of Muhammad. He takes, he claims that he takes some of what Ibn Isak says, threw out much of it because he didn't trust it, and only wrote down what he wanted. So really, the biography of Muhammad does not come from Ibn Isak. It comes from Ibn Hisham. So let's throw away Ibn Isak. Don't need him because we have nothing written by him. Now, there's another biography, al Waqiri. He dies in 835. Uh, but do you notice how late this is after Muhammad? All right, just look at the dates. Now, for Muslims, the Sira is not that important. <clears throat> What's more important are the Hadith. These are the sayings of Muhammad. And they were first written down by a guy named Abu Hari. He died in 870. Uh, and another one is Sahih Muslim. He died in 875. Another is Tirmidhi, 884. Al -Maj Ibn Majah, 887. Abu Dawud, 899. Nisai, uh, 915. Before I get into that, those are the sayings of Muhammad. I have them in blue, a different color, so you can see them easily. And you notice that they are 240 years after Muhammad's death. But that's still not the rest of the traditions. You have two other forms known as the tafsir and the tafri, the commentaries and the histories. And the first one to write that genre of material down is Al-Tabri, who died in 923. That's the 10th century. So the earliest we get of anything written about Muhammad or early Islam, about anything that's happening on the emergence of Islam, comes 200 years after Muhammad's death. 
I want to put up Abdul Malik here because he comes in 692 and he is the one that introduces the name Muhammad. He puts it on the Dome of the Rock. He puts it on the inscriptions and also, also on the coins. We're going to talk about him later. That's 141 years before Ibn Hisham writes it down. But he has that intervening 140 years where Muhammad's name starts to take shape. But it's these people, the Abbasids, who come to power in 749, 750, who are actually the ones that give us the Muhammad we have today. They are the ones that introduce the narrative you all read today. And before their time, it was not the same narrative. Why? Well, because we're going to go back to what comes earlier than the Abbasids to find out what happened. Conclusion, Muhammad was revealed 84 years after the Abbasids created him, 141 years after he was first introduced, yet 201 years after he supposedly lived. Take that on board. That's a huge statement that I'm making, but I'm going to have to support it, aren't I? Now, that's not the only problem. Look at the distance and direction of these different authors. The Islamic traditions say everything happened in those two cities, Mecca and Medina, in the central part of Arabia, on the western side. Yet all of the writers, the traditions, worked in Baghdad, which is 1,200 miles too far north. Ibn Hisham, the one who wrote the Siddha, is from Basra, but he grew up in Cairo. Uh, he also uh, uh, what did his writing in Baghdad, but... You notice he lives over 900 to 1,200 miles away. Al-Buhari, who writes that the Hadith is from Buhara, which is in Uzbekistan. Uh, that is 2,600 miles away from Mecca, Medina. Al-Tabari, who wrote the Tafsir and the Tafik, is from Tabaristan. That's 1,700 miles away from the Hijaz. Conclusion, none of the traditional writers lived or worked in Mecca or Medina. They were too far to the north of Mecca and came from the west and east of Baghdad. All of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from. So looking at this northern hegemony, let's just repeat that, what we've said before. Come down again. Notice when you look at this northern hegemony, the Islamic traditions say everything happened in Mecca and Medina. That's known as the Hejaz. Yet all of the writers of the traditions worked in Baghdad, which is 1,100 miles too far north. All of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from. Furthermore, all of the writers of the traditions worked in the 9th and 10th centuries. So conclusion, they all wrote their material hundreds of miles too far away and hundreds of years too late. There it is all in one one slide that you can look at. That is the problem. They're too late and too far away to be authoritative. Now, do we not have the same problem with Christianity? No, we don't. Let's do the same thing and ask about the tafsir, the tahdik, the hadith, and the siddha of Jesus, because all four genres exist. Now, I'm going to step on some of your toes. I'm going to use the most liberal dates I can find just to make my point. So, according to our tradition, uh, according to our New Testament, everybody agrees that Jesus died in 33 AD. We also get that from Tiberius. I'm sorry, from, uh, I'm sorry, he died under the time of Tiberius. We get that from Tacitus, the Roman historian, who tells us the date. The book of Acts, which would be the comparable to the Tahrik, the histories of uh, of Islam, the book of Acts is the history of the early church written by Luke around between 52 and 62 AD. That's 20 to 30 years after Christ's death. The, the Paul's letters, the tafsir written between 48 and 65 AD, that's 15 to 34 years after Christ's death. Mark is the, where we get the Siddha and the Hadith, the sayings of Jesus, the Hadith, and the story of Jesus, the Siddha, he writes around, he dies around 70 AD, so that's within 37 years of Christ's death. Matthew and Luke, who write also the Siddha and Hadith of Jesus, they die in around 80 AD, that's 47 years <clears throat> after Jesus' death. And then you have John, the last of the Siddha and the Hadith writer, he dies in around 90 AD, within 57 years of Christ's death. Within 29 to 57 years of Christ's death, we get the entire New Testament, which is the Tafsir, the Tahrik, the Sirah, and the Hadith of Jesus. There's the comparison. Note, all of these New Testament writers lived in the same place Jesus lived, 
and they either knew him personally, like Matthew and John, or they got their material from others who saw what he did and heard what he said. Can you see that difference? So comparing Christianity to Islam, when were the earliest biographies and sayings for both faiths written? Well, Christianity, they were all written within 15 to 60 years of Christ's death. For Islam, two to 300 years later and hundreds of miles too far north. Which would you guess is more authoritative? As a comparison, if we had to depend on sources for Jesus, comparable to what Muslims are dependent on for Muhammad, Jesus would not begin to appear until the third century. That's why the scholars are concerned. Why did it take so long? Were these people illiterate? No, look at the cities. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo. These are not illiterate cities. Where did, the, where did these 9th and 10th century traditional compilers get their material? Can we trust it if it's so late? Shouldn't we go back to the 7th century and to the place where these events happen? Notice, for this talk, I'm only interested in the 7th and 8th century. I'm not going to waste my time with the 9th to 10th century or even later. What am I talking about? Remember I said, the, I asked the question, who created the biography, the first rendition, the first reference we have to Muhammad uh, in a book form. And I said it was by Ibn Ishaq, but I said, no, not really. It's Ibn, it's actually Ibn Hisham who wrote that book down. And there's the picture of the book uh, by, translated by Alfred Guillaume uh, in, from French into English. But there was nothing about Muhammad's life at all from the ninth century. So no, we have nothing from Ibn Ishaq. We don't even have anything from Ibn Isham. So where did this book come from? Where did the Sira come from that gives us Muhammad's life? It actually comes from this man, Heinrich Ferdinand Wustenfell, who between 1858 and 1860 is the man who went to four different libraries and museums in four different German cities. He was German himself between those in those two year period and took out Arabic texts about this prophet Muhammad, all coming from the Ottoman period. And he put it together and compiled the life of Muhammad. That's the book we read today all written by Ferdinand Wustenfell, a German scholar, about 160 years ago. None of it do, can we trace back to Ibn Hisham from the 9th century at all. It's from the 19th century, a thousand years later, then translated by Guillaume and others later on. There's another rendition that came out in 1967 from Fouad Segnet, just from material that he found in Morocco. So the man who Muslims are dependent on to know who their prophet is or what he did is an elderly German linguist who wrote Muhammad's story 160 years ago, thus over 1,000 years too late. <laughs> and it just makes my job that much easier. Now, let's go to the 21st century, why the scholars are so concerned. Islam, as we know it, they say, did not exist in the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. The Quran probably was not revealed to one man in 22 years, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. Conclusion, the history of Islam, at least by the time of the Caliph Abdul Malik and before, is a later fabrication. So let's go into the problem of coins, using coins. Let's use some evidence to support what we're saying. Why are coins important? Well, the Lydians were the ones that introduced it in 600 BC. They were used for more than just commerce. Coins created and maintained a ruler's identity. Maybe they didn't have TV or internet or newspapers or radio. And so when they came to power, they needed something to introduce themselves to all the people. Coins were great because everybody would be handling them. And you can see who your new ruler is. Since everybody used them, a ruler knew that the best way to introduce himself was to mint new coins. What was on a coin? Well, they bore the image of the ruler. Now, hold on. In Islam, you can't have images, but yet these coins from the 7th century all have images on them. And what they would do, uh, they, uh, they would also put the name or the religion that uh, their identity belonged to, and the date was placed on. So they put their name, they would put their face, and they would delineate what religion they belonged to. These were then minted in the different mints in their empire. So, that's why we need to look at coins. Coins are great because they're made out of metal. They don't deteriorate. They don't disintegrate. So 
problem for the numismatists who are looking at the coins from the seventh century is that many of them are looking at these coins, they're, they're having a problem because they're trying to impose the Islamic tradition, the standard Islamic narrative on these coins, and they're just not making any sense. And that's why they have many of them are now having to reassess and look just at the coins. I've been asking many numismists who've contacted me in the last three years, please stop imposing the Islamic traditions on the coins. Just read the coins. Tell me what you find. And that's why we need to look at the coins. Dispense with the Islamic traditions. The task of any numismatist or a historian is to read what they're finding in front of them from the time period and the place that we are looking or are curious. Now, the numismatists lament that there doesn't seem to be any coins at all from the Hijaz, where all this is taking place. Interesting, right? When you look at the mints, now these are the mints uh, that according to Islamic tradition should be down in Mecca and Medina, because that's where the caliphs, they were living in Medina. They were ruling from Medina. They controlled from Turkey in the north down to what is Yemen today in the south from uh, what is Tripoli in the West, all the way over to Afghanistan in the East. All that land was under control. They had the mints. They were the ones producing the coins. Their names should be on them. Their faces should be on them. Something Islamic should be on all these coins. No mints whatsoever down that far south. Look at the mints and look and see where they are. Sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Where are the mints? Tartus, Hims, Balbek, Dimash, Tabaria, Abelia. Baysan, Jerash, Amman, Yumna, and Ilya. Those are where the mints are in the West. That's up in Lebanon, in Jordan, and in Syria, and in what is today Israel. Too far north, 600 to 1,000 to 1,200 miles too far north. Now, the ones in the East are in, in Susa, Dash, Bishapur, Harajan, Tanbuk, Kazarun, Istakhar, Darabjir, Adarshar, Kura, and Kavat Kura. I'm desecrating the language, my, my apologies. But those are all in what is today Iran and Iraq, too far to the east and too far north again. Nothing from Mecca and Medina. And why? Well, possibly because no one was living that far south. We don't have any reference, as we saw before, of Mecca. And there's no water down there, so there's no people, no people, no towns, no towns, no cities, no, city, no civilization, no history, as I said last week. So it's obvious when you look at the map that all of these mints would have been under the authority of an Arab leader or caliph in the 7th century, including any Muslim caliph. Yet none of these mints were from the Hijaz. Instead, they were all situated too far north. So let's use a timeline and look at see what we find about the coins. Muhammad dies, but there are no coins. No Islamic coins exist during his time, nor during the entire Rashidun period. There is nothing Islamic about any coins from 624 to 661. Oh, there are coins. We know in the Sassanid Empire there are coins. And these are Arab coins, and yet, but they're all Christian. Take a look. These are the coins that are coming from that era and from those places. Notice there is a picture of the rulers but they're all holding crosses. All the coins from 622, 624 up to 661 are Christian. None of them are Muslim. Why would, if it was a Muslim, they would have names like Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and I. No names, those four names don't exist at all. No one called Muhammad exists on those coins. When we get to the time of Mu'awiyah in 661, so now we're 30 years after Muhammad died, after the Caliphate was introduced, he then introduces his coins. And here you see, here he is. There's a picture of, of Mu'uwea with a cross above his head. He's holding a cross. There you can see him on the right. And that's a very famous coin. He has a cross above his head. If you look at the one on the far right, there's the name Muhammad below the cross, below the M with the cross above it. Muhammad is the name for Muhammad, the praised one. That's what it means. So who is the praised one here? That's well, not Muhammad the prophet, obviously. Who do you think that is? Who is? Well, everybody called himself the praise one. Those are his coins. Over in the east, he introduces these coins. Uh, then they have the Zoroastrian fire altar on them, suggesting very clearly that nothing Islamic whatsoever on any of these coins. I just want to show you this inscription that we have put together. Here is an inscription in Taif, and it's in, written in Greek and in Aramaic, not in Arabic. Well, that's interesting. It dates to around 663. And notice there's a cross right there. A cross. What's a cross doing on a Muslim inscription? 
And there's the reference to Mu'uiah, the servant of God and the commander of the believer. What God and what believers? Well, look at the cross. He is a Christian. He is not a Muslim. The Umayyad Mater, uh, uh, Caliph, the first of the Umayyad Caliphs, was not a Muslim at all. That, and that is not till we get then to Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik introduces the coin on the right. On the left, you see the Byzantine coins. On the right, he does he mimics the Byzantine coins and mocks them, takes the cross off their orbs, take and desecrates the Byzantine cross on the back side. Uh, Justinian II goes to war with him because of that coin, loses the war. Abdul Malik wins the war and introduces this coin with a picture of himself holding a sword. Here you see the Shahada is introduced. La ilaha illa Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is only one God, but God and Muhammad is the praised one with a mockery of the Byzantine cross on the back side. That's in 693. So he's still on the coin. His image is on the coin. His name is on the coin. And then finally, he introduces these coins in 696. These coins, I don't have time to unpack it. They are all reference against and attacking Jesus Christ. Say not three, God is one and he has no son. For God does not begetteth, nor is he begotten. There is only one God, but God and the praise one, of course, who is the praise one in this case? It would be Jesus because it's all attacking Jesus. It's attacking his divinity, attacking his trinity, uh, attacking the sonship of Jesus. Say not three, say, uh, say not three, for God is one. And then, of course, he says the praise one is nothing more than the messenger. That's introduced on 696 and all the coins after 696 that have those nomenclatures. So can you see, as we're looking at this, you can tell, just look at the review here. You can see all of this has to do with the sequence of how then Islam was finally introduced, possibly sometime during the reign of Abdul Malik or later. Why do I say it later? Well, let's go to the inscriptions, the rock inscriptions. See, the rock inscriptions, like the coins, are great because they don't disintegrate. They don't deteriorate. You can see the writing on them. You can read the writings on them. Notice where the rock inscriptions are found in the 7th century. They're way up in the north in Jordan or Yemen in the south. Nothing in the middle. Those, pick, those ones that you see in the middle are all from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. The earliest ones in the 7th century are either too far north or too far south. Again, following the same problem we saw with Mecca when our fir first talk. Now, the most famous inscription is the one I just told you about, the Mu'uya. Here you have him, and he talks about himself. He gives his name there as a servant of God. Obviously, he's not, there's nothing Islamic in any of these inscriptions. It's all about the believers, that's the Christian believers, and this him being a servant of their God. Ilka Lindstedt has done the most work on the inscriptions. Uh, he wanted to look at, sorry, let's go back. Uh, he looked at 100 rock inscriptions. Actually, he's looking, he, there are 30,000 of these inscriptions, but he wants, he looked at the most famous ones, 100 rock inscriptions dated from 640 to 740. That's that 100 year period, just after the time of, if Muhammad did exist, when he would have died, up until the time when the Abbasids were about to take over. So it's during the Umayyad period. He noticed that prior to 690, there were no evidence of anything Islamic on the inscriptions. Except for formula, everything comes after 690. After 690, between 690 and 710, the name of the Prophet Muhammad begins to appear as a person rather than just a title, the praised one, because that's what Muhammad means. It's not a name. It's a title in Arabic, means the praised one. It becomes the name of a person around that time. Look at that's the late 7th century going into the 8th century. From 710 to 720, you start starting to see the Muslim rites start to appear, like the pilgrimage and the prayer and the fast. And then it's not until 720 to 730 that the names Muslim as a people and Islam as a specific group begin to appear in contradistinction to Christianity. Folks, that's 100 years after Muhammad. Are you seeing the dates? We're well into the 8th century before we finally see a Muslim entity or an Islamic religion start to really take shape. And it's the beginning of the, Uma, of the Mu, uh, Umayyad dynasty just leading up into the beginning of the Abbasid dynasty. 
It was only in the 730s onwards that there is evidence of a popular devotion to Muhammad as a prophet and messenger, which makes the Islamic traditions incredibly awkward. Furthermore, there is a hundred years silence prior to this that indicates that Islam did not exist as a distinct religion until long after the time of Muhammad, which casts doubt on whether he had any part in starting Islam. I want to just put at this inscription here, which just came out. I put it up three weeks ago already. Uh, 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 I don't even know how many we've had. Uh, if you look at, we've had over hundred, almost uh, over 160,000 people have looked at this video in just the last three weeks. That inscription is from Taif. It's above Mecca. It's in that one of the stations along the Western Plateau. And this inscription, it was written in 697 to 698. It's an important inscription because it says this was written in the year of the Masjid al-Haram was built in the 78th year. The Masjid al-Haram is where the Kaaba is. That's that area where the Kaaba sits right in the middle of Mecca. And it's saying that it was built. That means the whole area, including the Kaaba, was built in 78th year. 78th year means what? The 78th year from the Hijra, which would be 622 which may put, put it around 697 to 698. That's enormously damaging because that suggests, therefore, that the Masjid al-Haram was built at that time. Now, Muslims are trying to push back by saying it means rebuilt. No, those are two different words. The word built is bunia. And that's what's written on the inscription on the rock. It is ueda bina wuha would, would have to, it would mean rebuilt, and that's not written on the rock there. Thus, it was constructed during the time of Abd al-Malik, who ruled from 685 to 705, and not at the time of Adam Eve, as Muslims like to tell us, or even during the time of Abraham, and certainly not even at the time of Muhammad. This is really damaging. Go see the video that has been put up on this. Conclusions. We need to come to conclusions so that we can wrap it all up. When all is said and done, the Premise, where is there any evidence for Muhammad in the seventh? That's what we're asking. Remember, that's what we want to ask. Now, the coins prove that there is no evidence of Muhammad or the Quran or a city called Mecca or of people called Muslims or of any religion called Islam until 692, which is 60 years too late, at least from the historical perspective. The 30,000 rock inscriptions which have been researched so far, all of which are north and not in the Hijaz, show that prior to 690 AD, there is nothing Islamic in any of them. And that an evolution of Islamic thought and practice can be noted between 690 and 730. That is way too late. That's 60 to 100 years after Muhammad died. Much too late to support the Islamic traditions. All of the 7th to 8th century references to Muhammad. I didn't get into this today because we don't have time. But if you look at Thomas the Presbyter or Sabaeus in 670s or John Bar Benkeia in 690 or John Nikiu in 690s and John of Damascus in 730. So there are reference to this name or this title called Muhammad. Well known. But they are all from way too far north. They place this Muhammad way up in Damascus and in Gaza and as far away as Kufa in the east. Thus, therefore, they're referring to another Muhammad, or they are all written way too late to be worthy because they are not written in the 7th century. The Astanami letter is a 16th century forgery that's there in the monastery, St. Catherine's Monastery, redacted back to Muhammad by monks in the St. Catherine's Monastery in order to protect themselves from the surrounding Muslim horde. So it's a 16th century forgery. The constitution of Medina, the Muslims pushed for to prove Muhammad exists, is not from Muhammad at all, but was created by Ibn Isham in 833 and then redacted back. To Muhammad. The doctrine of Kobi has nothing to do with Muhammad, but is about another man from that time, possibly Umar, who is well known. And he is the one that takes over Jerusalem, but he is a Jew from Hira, which is in Iraq today, too far north, wrong religion, and the wrong place. The four references to Muhammad in the Quran really only refer to the Blessed One. We haven't time to look at the Quran, but they are in almost three, and uh, there's only four references to his name in the Arabic. And they could be almost anyone. In fact, three of them possibly could be referring to Jesus himself. The references to Muhammad on the Dome of the Rock, the Blessed One, could either be referring to Jesus or a person named Muhammad or even to Abdul Malik because of the time and the reference. Now, a final thought. Initially, 
when asked previously in a 1995 debate with Dr. Jamal Badawi, what was our proof for suspecting that Muhammad, the Muhammad of the ninth century, our only recourse, or my only recourse, was to note the late dates for the Islamic traditions, the first part of this talk. That's the Siddha Hadith Hatafsir and Tahik, pointing out that they didn't exist until two to three hundred years after the fact. That's where the Al Hal Ihal had to go on. That's all I had to go on. His response was that we are only arguing from silence and that the absence of evidence does not prove the evidence of absence, which shut down the debate back in 1995. I couldn't go any further than that. But see, that was 1995. Today, in 2023, we now are no longer arguing from silence, as the 7th century evidence against the 9th century Muhammad living in the 7th century is huge and growing, so that the burden of proof has finally flipped. We now have coins, we have rock inscriptions, we have buildings, we also have manuscripts. That's for next our next talk. And as finally the Muslims and their advocates who are now the ones who are the ones who are now arguing from science. They are the ones who are going to have to tell us where is the evidence. We have the evidence finally. We're not arguing from science. In fact, everything they're saying now argues from silence. Consequently, every time they make a claim for their ninth century Muhammad, all we have to do is ask six simple words. Prove it from the seventh century. Prove it from the seventh century. Now, the importance of Muhammad. Islam is dependent on the book, the place, and the man. When you begin to confront the man, Muhammad, and other, the other two begin to wobble. If you destroy the man, Muhammad, or destroy the other two, the other two are then destroyed as well. So therefore, when we cast doubt on Islam, as we're doing in this talk today, we can get, introduce our Muslims to a better book, a better man, Jesus Christ. Let's bring them home. Okay, over to questions to you, Speeder. Thank you very much, Jay. So uh, Jay's have been reviewing for us the evidence for Muhammad or perhaps the lack of evidence in the seventh and eighth century and showing how the dates correlate. And we've got a time of question and answer now. Jay, last week you said, imagine a Christianity without the New Testament, Jesus and Jerusalem, dating mm -hmm. from the first century. And uh, you, you said in effect that's what we've got with islam and islam without uh, the quran muhammad or mecca in terms of seventh uh, century influence and that that's uh, quite uh, a contention now uh, on the basis of what you've said that islam didn't really develop in its present form until the abbasid period from 750 ad uh, and on uh, during that great empire, the second one of Islam after, after the Umayyads. Well, what do you think what, what do you think was the motivation of those who developed it in the Abbasid period? What were they trying to uh, conclude or convey? I mean, what, what was the point of having a prophet and a book and a place if, if that was when it really was developed 200 years well, after? Well, this is going to take about an hour to answer this question. <laughs> Let me you see if I can the show. The show give it in five minutes. What you have here is really an internecine Christian squabble going on. You have basically, uh, you have the Byzantine Christianity who are the Orthodox Christians. They control the major cities. Uh, they, though they had conquered the Sassanid, Sassanids or the Persians in 622. That's why 622 is so important. When they conquered them, pretty much the Byzantines then went back towards the West because all the problems were coming from the West. They let the East alone, which left the Arabs who now were out, uh, away from the oppression of the Persians. They no longer had the Persians oppressing them. They pretty much could now control their own destiny. The Arabs were Ishmaelites. They came in the line of Ishmael, and they were Nabataeans, most of them, and they come from Jordan in that area. They were Christians, no doubt about it, and some were Jews as well. But the people in power in the cities were all Christians, and they their language was Aramaic. Uh, it was Nabataean Aramaic and Syriac Aramaic. Nabataean in the Jordan area, Syriac in the Syrian area. 
And they were the ones that controlled all of the religious edifices, uh, edifices and also the, the theology. All of their material was in Aramaic. But the Arabs didn't speak Aramaic. And the Arabs who were the ones who were the, uh, who were the traders and the people who were moving around, they were the ones who were living outside the cities. They did not have a good relationship with the uh, Byzantine Christian Orthodox people and the bishops in the cities. But they couldn't do anything or didn't really care until you get Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik is a big person. He is a caliph and he is part of the Umayyad caliph. And he is an anti Trinitarian. He is an Aryan coming from Merz, Mer, which is way up in Uzbekistan. His family, the Marwans, take over from the Sufyanis in Damascus. He now is against Byzantine Christianity. So his whole premise is against the Trinity and against the divinity of Jesus. He is the one that attacks Justinian II, the second, destroys him, and then in, puts up the Dome of the Rock. Look and see where it is, right there in Jerusalem. Should be up in Damascus where he's living. No, it's in Jerusalem. Look at all the inscriptions. They're all against the divinity of Jesus, the Trinity, and the sonship of Jesus. It's all attacking Jesus. And it's looking down on the Church of the Sepulchre, where the Christians were going for pilgrimage. He, is, he didn't start Islam, and he did not call himself a Muslim. He was still a Christian, but an anti-Trinitarian Christian. Now, let's move on. As the Abbasids come to power in the 740s and 50s, they now need, they are anti-Trinitarian, but they don't want to be Christians anymore because Christians are Trinitarian. But they are, they are Arabs who don't have an identity. They don't have a book and they don't have a prophet. The Christians and Jews have a book and a prophet. How do you create that identity for yourself? Well, number one, you then create a prophet. And the prophet's already there because Abdul Malik has introduced him as the praised one. They make him into a man. But once you make him a prophet, he then has to have a book. That's why the Quran is put early together, borrowing from many different sources. We're going to talk about that in the next talk. What's fascinating is that all happens in the 8th century. By the time the Abbasids come to power, they then have the man, the book. They still need a place. The place has already been chosen because the Black Rock, which was in Petra, was destroyed the, whereas Petra was destroyed in 687 by, um, uh, I can't remember his name right now, Ibn, uh, Zub Zubair, Ibn Zubair, he takes the black stone and takes it down to his homeland, which is Mecca, and the pilgrims start to follow the black stone. You always go where God's presence is. That's why Mecca became important. They're following the black stone. Now, once you have the Abbasids who then uh, uh, ally themselves with Zubair against their hated Arabs who are up in Damascus. They then put their headquarters in Baghdad. They now have the book, the man, and now they have the place. Therefore, Islam is really was created as a rejection of Jesus, his divinity, the Trinity, and everything we know to be holy. That's why so much of Islam is against our Lord Jesus Christ. It was started that to create an identity for these Arabs who needed a man, a place, and a book. Thank you, Jay. Uh, oh, that, that was a great summary of what you said would take an hour. So uh, uh, brilliant, well done. Now, um, when, it, when it comes to uh, references to the Muhammad himself, I think what you said will perhaps surprise many people that there are only four references to Muhammad in the whole of the Quran, and, and three of them may refer to, to Christ. When uh, Abdul Malik talks about Muhammad uh, in, in the 690s, he's talking about a person called the, the Blessed One. So most of what we know about Muhammad, just to be clear, does not come from the Quran at all. It comes from the, the Surah and the Hadith, which, as you've argued, are dated much uh, later than this. So what does the evidence tell us about uh, who Muhammad was? Uh, was he... Uh, a, a, and I mean the evidence outside the, the Quran and the Hadith. Was he a, a military leader, a prophet, a political leader, or perhaps even a, a person who did not exist and was uh, created late, later on to unite an empire and give it an identity? Well, you know where I'm going to go with that. 
he didn't exist at all. There was no Muhammad. There were many Muhammads. There were many people used that title. Uh, Umar used that title. Um, well, it could looks like Abdul Malik could have used that title. It could looks like Jesus was given that title on the coins and also on the inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock. So it looks like in what we're saying is this Muhammad never exists. Now, when I say that, let me just let me just back what I'm saying. I'm not saying Muhammad did not exist. I'm saying the Muhammad of Islam did not exist. The Muhammad who was lived, was born in Mecca and lived in Medina, the Muhammad who received the Quran, the Muhammad who called himself a Muslim, and the Muhammad who introduced Islam, that Muhammad did not exist. Because there's no proof for him. There's no reference for that Muhammad that far south on any coins, on anything. There's just no reference for a very good reason. There is no place down there to accommodate him or to accommodate something as sophisticated as the Quran, as we're going to find in the next lecture. When it comes to the inscriptions and the coins, uh, I mean, we, we know that new inscriptions and coins are being discovered uh, all the time, which are helping to rewrite history. Uh, might Muslims not answer, argue that, that uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence with regard to coins and inscriptions from the seventh century? Maybe they've just not been found yet because we haven't looked hard enough. What would you, what would you say to that? Very easy. Let me just give you, let's just take that one on board. Al-Jalad, who is considered to be the world's leading scholar on early, uh, early Arabic. He is the one that is looking at the Arabic and he's saying, look at the Quran. Look at the Arabic in the Quran today. Notice it. It has the Alaf Maksura. It has the Tar Marbuta. Tar Marbuta is the T that comes at the end of the letters, uh, words to give it a, a feminine form. The Alaf Maksura is like, a, like an S shape. It has the definite article, al the. All through the Quran, you have these. But when you look at the Arabic that would have existed in Mecca and Medina, where the Quran supposedly was originated, that Arabic is Sabaic. That is from way down in Yemen. The Sabaic Arabic does not have the Talmud, but the, does not have the Alaf Maksura, does not have the definite article. So how can the Quran have all of these in uh, Arabic that does not come from the Mecca and Medina? So where does this Arabic come from? And Al-Jalad said, this is Nabataean Aramaic. This is from Jordan, 600 miles further north. So even the inscriptions that you saw on those rocks, the inscriptions that are on the coins, they're all, they all use the Tarmat Buddha, the Alaf Maksura, the definite article, and the Irabs, the, the, uh, the endings, Irab endings. That is uh, an Arabic that is in the wrong place if it was from a man named Muhammad living in Mecca, Medina. So the inscriptions show us where the Arabic comes from, and that's all from further north, nothing from the metal part of Arabia at all. Now, when it comes to archaeology, and particularly coins and inscriptions, there's, there's no doubt that a person called Abdul Malik existed. We know what he inscribed and, and the things that he, he wrote. That we're, we're talking about 690 there. You've uh, you've argued that the evidence for Muhammad earlier is not is not there. But what about the other key figures in Islam who are referred to in the Hadith? And, and I'm thinking particularly about uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, uh, Ali, the four rightly guided caliphs, supposedly. Um, is there much in the way of archaeological or coin evidence for these people? Because they must have been very significant rulers with huge power over vast areas of of land so uh, what, what what about that absolutely and that's where the rubber hits the road you would expect if they are caliphs abu bakr 633 632 to 634 omar 634 to 644 uthman 644 to 656 and ali 656 to 661 that's that 40 year period that 30 year period sorry including Muhammad, who would have been six, uh, 624 to 632. That four, those five rightly guided caliphs with that part of that much of history, 40 years of history, who controlled from Turkey in the north down to Yemen in the south, from uh, Tripoli in the west over to Afghanistan, there would be one reference to any of them, not one word about any of them. They're not on any coins. Their names are not on any inscriptions. There is people called Umar. Umar is a common name. As I said, Umar is the guy from Hira who is way over in the east from Hira. He is way up north. He is in the east. He comes across and he conquers Jerusalem in 638. There is reference to him. 
uh, Sophronius, who is the, the, the bishop there in Jerusalem, welcomes him, has him, wants him to come and actually pray at the Church of the Sepulchre. He refuses to. He goes up to Jerusalem because he's a Jew. He's not a Muslim. There's no reference to him being a Muslim. And he's not from Mecca, Medina. He's from Hira, from Iraq. And he goes and builds a structure on the Mount Moriah. Why? Because he wants to welcome the, the Messiah back. In 644, he then becomes a Christian. He converts to Christianity. Still no reference to any Umar named Muhammad. I'm sorry, any um, uh, Muslim, any Umar who is a Muslim, who is uh, from Islam, from living back in Mecca, Medina. There is no reference to uh, anybody called Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is a common name, father uh, of of Bakar. Bakar are all the people from Iraq today. So there are many Abu Bakars, but none, none of them are from Mecca, Medina. Uh, as far as Uthman, we can't find any reference to Uthman. Ali, again, is a common name, and Ali's are found all over what is today uh, Iran and Iraq, but none of them live in Mecca, Medina, and they are not caliphs. So all of this can be thrown out because you've got the wrong people at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. So when are the earliest references to these four rightly guided caliphs? Is it, which literature is it in and when does it date from? Oh, they all start coming with Ibn Hisham. That's where you start to get the story. Now look at, notice, look at the date of that story. Remember, the um, Umayyads controlled for about 100 years from 661 to about 740, 7, uh, uh, 749. So about roughly 90 years, they controlled all that swath of land. Where is their information? Where are all their texts? Where are all their stories? They don't exist. We do know about all the Umayyads because of outside information from other people who are having contact with them. Lots of material coming from China. China is a treasure trove which, because it was not affected. It would not, no one controlled their, uh, their writings. When the Abbasids come to power in 749, 750, they then destroy everything the Umayyads have written purposely. Mm -hmm because they want to introduce their narrative. That's why Ibn Ishaq was the first one to write down what we thought was this book. But this doesn't come from Ibn Ishaq. He died in 765. So within 15 years, they first have the first biography. Where is that biography? We don't have it. Why? Because obviously it had a lot of Umayyad material in it. And that's why it took them another seven, it took them 70 years from 650 up to 833 to finally get Ibn Hisham to write the now the narrative they wanted. And that narrative says that he took some of Ibn Ishaq and threw the rest away. But that narrative was written in 833 by Ibn Hisham. So we're told. But where is Ibn Hisham's records? Where is his manuscripts? His manuscripts are from a German scholar named Wustenfeld, who wrote in 1860 using material that he borrowed from the Ottoman period. So almost everything we know now about Muhammad, about his life, the first documents that we have on who all these, these different caliphs is from the Ottoman period. Remember, the Ottomans come to power in 1290 and continue up until 1924. So you're talking about that 700-year period from the 13th century on. That's where we get the Muhammad of today. So and I guess it makes sense, doesn't it, that in the context of an empire where there was huge control over what was preserved and propagated, it would be in the interests of such an empire to ensure that earlier. And they say that, you know, this. Removed. Yeah, they say that, Peter, you remember, you've heard this many times. The Muslims admit that Al-Buhari in 870 or just before, when I say 870, that's his death date. So the 20 years yeah. prior to that. He was given 600,000 of these Akbar. Where are these Akbars from? These are sayings. These are stories. They're all from the Umayyad period. He was given 600,000 of these Akbar, and he was to go and throw out those that he did not like. He whittled them down to 7,397. From 600,000 to 7,397, he only retained 2%, threw out 98%. So that's in the traditions. We know that. That's that censorship that's going on. So that wholesale censorship of throwing out anything they did not like and introducing their own narrative about their man, their book, and their place. All was introduced by Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Tirmid. They all are introduced in the 9th and 10th century, and it's all happening in Baghdad, not in Mecca, not in Medina. It's two, hundreds of miles further north and hundreds of years too late. Now, as we know, the two major branches of Islam, so you've got the, the, um, the Sunnis, of course, who look right back to all four rightly guided caliphs, don't they, and the Quran and the Hadith. And then you've got the, the Shias who look back to 
Ali alone. They don't forget the first three, but, but both of those major branches of Islam go back to these four people for whom you say there is really nothing in the way of, of historical evidence uh, from the period that we're talking about. So that, that leaves big question marks for both of the major branches of Islam, does it not? Yeah, absolutely. And look and see, Sunnism and Shiism have nothing to do with theology. It all has to do with politics. It all has to do with succession. Who then takes the mantle of the prophet? Well, this is a much later dispute. This is not a dispute that was happening in the seventh century. This is a dispute that was happening with the Abbasids. The Abbasids are the ones who are the Persians. Remember, they are the ones who are the Persians, and they would like the succession to come from Ali. So that's why this is introduced in the ninth and 10th century while they're in power. That's why it's so important that you put it in the right perspective. It's a political power play as to who should be the one in charge. It should, should it be from the line of the prophet since he didn't have any, well, he had two sons, but they died in child at, at young age. He only had four daughters. So therefore he needed to have a uh, inherit. Uh, he needed to have an heir. That's why Ali became that heir. He was an adopted son. That's why the whole thing was, should it be from, the uh, timeline of Ali, or should it be from the ulema, the scholars, those anybody who was who could uh, be uh, who is in who is in authority? And of course, the Sunni said it must be somebody in authority, not from Ali's lineage. That's so. It's a political power play. That's why the whole Sunni Shiite divide is a much later political problem. There, it makes sense. It fits perfectly in the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth century, not in the seventh century. Fascinating. Well, uh, very sadly, we have run out of out of time, but you've given us a huge amount to think about. But Jay will be back with us on Thursday, the 29th of June, for the final session of the four on understanding Islam. And there we'll be focusing not on Mecca, not on Muhammad, but the, the Quran itself, and in particular, looking at the manuscript evidence for that and asking the question, uh, was it ever changed and when was it written and finalized? So uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for coming along and contributing for your, for your questions, for your presence. Uh, do spread the word. And, and thanks uh, so much, Jay, for your time and uh, input today. It's been incredibly stimulating, and we look forward to hearing the fourth of the series. And if you've only just heard this one and missed the first two, let me encourage you to go back and look at them, they're all available on our website. This is uh, largely new material that we're looking at here today. So on behalf of all ICMDA uh, and the team, uh, may the Lord bless you, and we look forward to seeing you again on ICMDA webinars 